clouds and standards. Uh, we've, for today and probably also tomorrow, we have heard a lot about technology, technical stuff. We heard it from Felix, where's Felix about, uh, he's living and breathing OpenStack, and it was nice to hear about that, but um, I'm talking about standards. And kudos goes to Sebastian, because he basically took away one third or two third of my talk with uh, saying standardize, standardize, standardize to uh, go uh, real, reliable and, uh, and on high, high availability um, in your cloud operations. I'm yet to see uh, Sebastian do the, the monkey, the Steve Bomber, <laughs> standardize, standardize, standardize and do things. Um, but I'm also very aware of time. So um, in English, you have the term hangry. I don't know whether you know that. It's a combination of being hungry and angry, so hopefully I'm, I'm not getting angry, you're not getting ang angry with me, but my kids regularly get hangry at dinner time, so I'll try to go through. So what I'm talking about, we have a problem, and I'll tell you why we have a problem. Um, I'll tell you a bit about standards, probably not the way Sebastian was talking about it, but the way other people talk about it, and everybody oh, goes yawning that again. Um, I talk a bit about business, what business impact or what impact standards have on business and vice versa. There are some mechanics that, are, that quite some people are not really aware of when and how standards emerge and why they're useful. And then I'll, um, I'll dream. I start, start to dream about a world of standards and when you start to think about it, you will realize that the world is full of standards. And then, of course, as every talk should have that, some conclusions. So, Houston, we have a problem. And this depicts the entire problem that we have on the policy level of the standards, because, you know, standards are like toothbrushes. Everybody finds it a grand idea, but everybody rather uses their own instead of sharing a toothbrush. You know, for obvious reasons, I use my toothbrush, Google uses their toothbrush, Amazon uses their toothbrush, and then we have a problem, which is this. We are playing the Game of Thrones in the cloud landscape, particularly in the uh, um, infrastructure as a service cloud landscape. Now, there, were, there used to be seven kingdoms. Um, some of the representatives of the seven kingdoms over here. We have Sebastian from uh, Google. We have Pavel from uh, Microsoft. And then some others are here, some others are not here. Maybe they saw the title of my talk and said, no, I'd rather not come. But um, you know, it's really, um, when I thought about it, everybody's plotting against everybody. It's carnage, it's war. Which, who has with whom an alliance and who doesn't, which alliance lasts for as long as it benefits me, and then I'll just eat you for breakfast things like that, um, we really play that game, we play it very well. The problem is this. Uh, the big players uh, build the big wall, they say, ooh, there's this big beast outside, leave us alone, leave us alone with your bloody standards, we don't want that, business is free, the freedom of the market, we're gonna do it on our own. No, you're not. And this is standard seen by the market, we are the big ugly beasts, um, and it's uh, to be avoided at all peril. You know, it's, uh, it's really like that. Um, interestingly enough, <laughs> there are many other ways of how this is going to be seen. This is how the EU is seen by the UK and by the UK tablet, but that's another story. But this is the big thing. It's not as bad as, as, bad as you thought, and not as bad as I think, even though I probably was hungry when I uh, wrote my slides. So let's go a bit into the mechanics. We have heard a lot from Sebastian about standardize, 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 a bit from uh, um, Florian about um, OpenStack interop, which I think is, uh, is a bit of a funny thing, because I think if I use two OpenStack deployments, it should be a given that they interoperate with each other. Otherwise, they are not interoperable, and they don't adhere to the same APIs and conventions. So there's a specific meaning with standards about interoperability and conformance, and actually compliance and, uh, and being con uh, compliant to something. So, a bit about standards. There we have several different types of standards, and what Sebastian meant is something that I have not on the slides here. Um, and we classify them by their origin and by their attached intellectual property rights, because that becomes, or IPR stands for intellectual property rights, ownership, and control, because that becomes very, very important. So, one of the uh, most named terms are the factor standards, is something that typically comes from one company in the cloud world that probably would be EC2 and S3 as the de facto standards for accessing infrastructure as a service. They're coming from Amazon and it's uh, Amazon's ownership alone, even though some, a lot of cloud stacks say they want to be Amazons, they implement EC2 and S3, but they're, never, they're always playing the catching up game and they will always lose with the latest version of uh, S3 and uh, EC2. Industry standards um, is something that um, 
By the way, these terms are somewhat interchangeable, um, orthogonal, because industry standards can be de facto standards and vice versa, but the classification for the talks comes more from that it's, it's an agreement between many, almost a gentleman's agreement between many companies that are it's an unregulated and emerging uh, agreement between, between companies that some, something, some interface, some standard is a good idea. It can be a best practice, it can be a, uh, an interface definition, it can be a policy level uh, security controls type of standard. RPR there is undefined, it's either by choice, because nobody asked the question, I would say that EC2 and S3 are industry standards, and IPR issues are undefined, which is, can pose a major risk if you look at, it, at standards from a business and liability point of view. Community standards are some that are expressly written in public processes, IETF, W3C, uh, OASIS and, and, and organizations like that are typically um, community organizations, OGF from the academia mostly. They are run and operating a certain specific industry sector and they typically have IPR patent uh, policies where um, companies that have patents in a certain area that's going to be standardized have to give typically a RAND license to anyone who wants to implement standards, which stands for reasonable and non-discriminatory um, license. It's often a uh, non-royalty license that you get it for free or things like that, but they're actually, uh, particularly in hot topics like IoT and 5G, for example, there are huge patent fights in the standardization bodies where you actually have to pay huge royalties uh, to be able to implement standards. And um, if you'd like, the, the crown standard, the euro um, or publicly defined standards, typically coming from organizations like NIST, for organizations like ETSI and NISA in Europe, and the ISO IEC, which have representatives of the national standardization bodies that then take standards or something that has been standardized they're typically in public policy or even law, which is why they're called often the euro. Now, um, when it comes to standards, um, they're written by humans and they're good examples, they're bad examples, and there's some really, really ugly examples. And I'll give you actually two. One is the most popular one, HTML and HTTP. They came out of where I sort of had a lot of exposure to from the high energy physicists area from CERN. Tim Berners-Lee back then uh, worked at CERN and actually he had to find a problem, to, he had to solve a problem to actually store and make, make ac publicly accessible his physical, uh, uh, physics papers from the high energy physics domain. And um, it was a, a very grassroots environment and at some point he made a very, very important decision. HTML and HTTP are first of all orthogonal, you can combine them, but you can use them on their own, which makes them reusable and a repeatable pattern. But he also put the standards into the public domain, uh, and he claimed no owner, he claimed copyright, or, you know, you know, but you have in German law, Urheberrecht, I don't know how to, to translate that in, uh, into English, but that's basically one non-transferable law if you go into IP, man, IP law and IP management. Um, that you always be the origin and the named originator of a certain standard or a certain technology, but you can get licensing rights transferred to somebody else. But he said, I don't care. I don't want to. Here's it out there. People have a look. And it's a very good example of how things went from, say, industry, community sta level of standard down to up to a, con up to a, a, a community level because it has, a huge, has had a huge uptake. And then it got standardized in a the Euro way. Uh, by a not-for-profit not um, organization, the World Wide Web Consortium, which, which said, okay, HTTP and HTML had to be looked like that, this and this and this, and with that, uh, the conversion to one way of representing um, web data and how to transport that um, had an unprecedented uh, success in the entire world. Now, not so good, a bad example. I'm sorry about that. Pavel, where are you? <laughs> Don't take it personal. But this one is a really, really bad example. And it's a really bad example because you have to switch your inside-out look on standards into an outside-in look. You have to look at it uh, from the outside. Um, there has been a huge controversy about our XML or MS XML. Uh, probably it's my own speculation because it has never been validated. It has been introduced as a quick shot. Uh, to actually in the conjunction of the uh, um, uh, Monopoly um, case that was in, in that area in the late 90s and early 2000s in, the, in Europe with Microsoft. Uh, it was pushed through ECMA, which is, funny enough, a European Computer Manufacturers Association, but it's not really a standardization body, although it chaperones and stewards a lot of standards, what you would call like that. 
Um, it then even has been pushed through ISO IEC um, in that time. Interesting enough, the first version of it failed with um, big banners and everything. So they had to change that and then it went through, but still there was a huge controversy about how Microsoft actually went about that. Um, funny enough, which is why I would compare uh, Microsoft Office interoperability with OpenStack interoperability because even Microsoft Office versions between Macs and Windows don't interoperate on certain details and on certain parts. For, for example, if I do certain animations on Microsoft Office on, on my Mac, it doesn't work on Windows and vice versa. Transparency still doesn't work and things like that. So why would I assume interoperability between the same product and different versions? Um, so yes, the problem is it was an extremely controversial process. It was pushed down the throats of the standardization bodies for certain um, reasons. Um, it was protecting among enormous commercial interest because you look at the market, Microsoft Word, Microsoft Office, it's a huge market. It's a cash cow for Microsoft. Actually, I think it still is. Um, so the problem with that is um, it's put a huge damage on the reputation of standardization processes. The ugly, sorry, it's again Microsoft. Um, if, you, if you look at, uh, we really don't take it personal. It's, I know I've seen a lot of uh, very bad standards, but these are very domain specific. So this is one that probably everybody could relate to. Has anybody ever tried to read that um, conglomerate, the Magna Carta of Microsoft Office XML? It's a bit in dimensions like the IT library, a big thing. You know, if you want to have a library, every lawyer has a library, even if it is fake, but full of books. It's a bit like, like that stuff, so nobody understands that. So the point with that is it's not actually a standard as it's supposed to be. It's something that describes a very specific use case that basically only one company implements, and that's Microsoft, except for some tools around that that defeats the purpose of standards and almost entirely. So I'm talking here about standards, not on the uh, development life cycle and standardizing for my company internal processes. We are talking here about standards that are in intercompany relationship, relationships and company to customer, com business to business relationships, where it's from one administrative, um, administrative domain into another one where that comes into place. So how does, how does this work with each other, business and standards? Again, look at the white walkers, you are standards, go away. So um, this is based on something that um, Simon Wardley wrote at some point. If you look at the business life cycle, you have software technology, even interfaces, stuff like that, coming from Genesis, custom built services to product and rental, and in the end, everything, um, or some, most of the things get either in the, into the commodity market for products, or they actually get um, acquired or as, as a service in the utility market. And if you see that, the blue, the red, and the green dots are typically different product, products, different services, different technologies, different best practices. And the cycle goes on and on and on. And what he basically says is the cycle goes on with peace, war, and wonder. How that goes is typically you have a peaceful an industry peaceful domain if you're in custom build and product uh, in the product phase of anything that's innovated because the market is expanding, everybody finds their home and everybody is happy. Now when start, things start to be commoditized, to be uh, put into an industrial scale, then war starts because all of a sudden you, uh, the market is consolidating. That's a euphemism for that, but in, mark, in, in actual reality it's pretty much done war. What's happening? But then once you have, uh, you know, we have the packing order settled, then the wonder starts because all of a sudden on top of that, what's there at high throughput at a fairly process-wise standardized way, as you can say, um, the wonder, the new innovation starts and the cycle goes all over and all over again. Now there are certain characteristics that actually play with standardization. Typically when you go, um, if you look at value of the value of either the, the margin um, of, of a profit of, of a service that you provide or a product that you sell, um, through the uh, throughput, you see that the commoditization, the margin drops dramatically, but your throughput gets high because you want to have your profit. And so you have to, they're sort of antagonists. If your margin goes low, your throughput has to go higher to make you your profit. But it has profound impacts. And if you look at standards and risk management, if you do your software architecture and then use a typical component level, you look at one component providing and offering an interface, 
and others uh, you program against that. Typically, uh, the, the, the higher ordered service is using a, a service from a lower order on a predefined um, interface. And if you have more than one service on the higher level using the, uh, the ideas or the, the value add from a lower level service, then you have an, a standardized interface, even though it's on a very low level. You have the same actually on business to business or business to consumer, where you have a service that is consumed, be it, uh, be it utility or electricity, be it your, your, your subscription to, I don't know, quick file as an accounting software or to Google Cloud Engine or something as, as your infrastructure as a service or platform as a service provider. Uh, it tries to do the same because you have not only have, you have one service provider, many, many different uh, people who actually use that. And you look at that and try to standardize that not only to technical interfaces, but on the business level through SLAs and SLOs. So you can compare these things with each other. And the interesting thing there is that often when you go into the consolidation phase, when your value and the margin of the actual service or utility provided is uh, dropping, or so do the uh, um, typical, very often do the, the market providers. In a healthy market, you still have a lot of participants because the actual demand or the need for a certain service is exploding. We are in the phase at the moment and for infrastructure as a service cloud and for software as a service cloud, the markets are increasing. If you look at the garden hype cycle, they're both uh, through the trough of disill disillusionments and they find their way of uh, business sustainability. Everybody understands the need is there. Everybody understands the, uh, the, the value of it. So everybody takes it and there are a plethora of providers. Um, the problem is, in a sort not so nice environment, when you start to see the uh, number of providers dropping. Now, these are not quantified graphs, these are qualifying graphs, so you have to keep that in mind, because um, if you have a market where the number of providers is dropping, uh, interestingly enough, then the value and the margin of those who provide the service is increasing again because they can make the market, and then you have an oligopoly or monopoly or similar interesting situations like that. And then again, what happens? You get regulation. The market will get regulated, and you get regulation is nothing else but a standardized way of how the market has to operate because it comes from legislation, it comes from policy, and there you have it. So um, you basically can't escape it. You either have technical standardization because of best practices, you have business standardization because of market pressure and market dynamics, or in a dysfunctional market, you get standardization because of regulation. So. I think it's not as bad as that. Don't be threatened. You can't hide from standardization. It will happen whether you want to or not. And besides, every techie, every geek has to have a cat picture in the slide. So herewith, I'm a, officially a techie and a geek. I do that. So what if you actually find a world or have a world that is full of standards that we realize standards are not a bad thing that actually can help you? Um, do we have sufficient standards? Uh, do we have too, too little standards? Are they good? Are they bad? So what I'm trying to give you is a an, an very roughly end-to-end -end look at on which level in the cloud environment we're actually operating and the proper standards that I or we have been uh, identifying collaboratively that go from very technical parts, very small, to large. There's even a standardization for service level management and service level, service level agreements actually out there freshly from this year. So. We start with the first one, um, relatively new, Redfish. Comes from, I think, the Distributed Management Task Force. Um, it's, it's a revamping of uh, standards that have been there on that level. Typically, if you look at SNMP, that level of, of hardware and, and element communication, they've revamped that for the massive scale of the cloud. It's uh, mostly looking at the hardware layer. Typical examples are fan speed, temperature, CPU temperature, and things like that. And it has been its first occurrence in the first published version is from 2015. Interestingly enough, on top of that, SNEAR, the Storage Network Industry Association, has, uh, taken that, it has taken that environment by storm, and they created Swordfish on top of that by actually uh, incorporating Redfish into their own standards, and they use that for the actual hardware and server layer management to provide the underlying hardware for the storage infrastructure. And that's, that stuff has come out mid of this year, I think in August was the first public release of the Swordfish, Swordfish um, standard. On top of that, um, or well, on top of that, um, the third ingredient uh, next to compute and storage and infrastructure as a service uh, cloud is network. And uh, beside the plethora of standards for um, RJ45, for network cabling, uh, RS, and, and all, the, all the standards that, that you network people know much more about than I do, 
OpenFlow is a very interesting um, environment and interesting development. I think it comes from open network functionalization uh, body um, that, um, that defines the actual interface and communication between the uh, forwarding plane and the control plane and switches and routers, which gives you very, very interesting ways of dynamically defining your network, basically network on demand, just like that. On top of that, um, a bit older uh, in its first occurrence, recently OCCI has been updated, and I can give you a bit of backstory at dinner if you're interested about that. From 2010 to 2011, CDMI is the uh, storage, uh, it's the interface described by storage coming from the um, SNIA or SNIA again. OCCI is, has been developed by OGF, the Open Grid Forum, which is, I would say, a community standards development organization rooting in the academia and they're in the high energy physics, physicists area covering the uh, open cloud computing, although you can use OCCI for all kinds of things, and the uh, storage, uh, the management of storage. On top of that, cloud application management protocol coming from Oasis Open is available since 2014. It's a publicly defined standard. It has a proper license. It has a proper patent uh, statement. Um, you have no, there, there's nothing for you to, to, to be afraid of if a company would actually start suing you for using their API or their, their, their intellectual property on that. On top of that, you have the actual app orchestration, and I like Tosca being mentioned by uh, Felix earlier, that uh, it's something that's one of the most promising um, hot topics, I would say, in, in standardization and in support for standardization for that. And last but not least, SLA framework. It has been recently developed and recently released with an ISO with heavy support of the European Commission. And I know some, some personal friends and personal business acquaintance of mine have been in that. And the most recent uh, release of that ISO 90086 um, was, I think, September this year with, with a formal vote on uh, whether to accept that as a formal um, standard or not. So we have been actually working there. When I was working at EGI, the European Grid Infrastructure that I was talking about earlier in the question, uh, we did all that as not only a, um, a proof of concept, if you like, but we had a real need. Um, EGI is a true federation of academic cloud resource or academic high throughput computing and uh, since recent also uh, academic cloud provider. And it's a real federation. It's, if you look at the governance structure of, say, Germany, the Federal Republic of Germany, or other federated governments, you have a fair amount of freedom and authority on the uh, lower level in Germany, the states, and in EGI it would be the national and the local uh, resource infrastructure providers. So they had a very bad experience that they were forced in earlier projects and earlier ways to deploy exactly one middleware management stack, which was horrible, which was a bad and an ugly one from academia in the high energy physics area. Those who are from that area, they will probably know what I'm talking about. Um, I let the sheep sleep. Uh, it's, not, it's best to not wake them up again. But we had the problem that um, they, in the terms of cloud, they didn't want to deploy or standardize on one cloud management framework. And uh, so we came up, okay, so we, we say we have a thin federation and we require you guys to adhere to uh, certain standards. And there you see all but some examples, accounting, monitoring, information discovery for the actual automation of the infrastructure, uh, the shared and federated virtual machine repository for people to spin up their, their, their scientific workloads, compute access, access to the compute resource and the storage access and all these kind of things. We have identified at a common interest that had to be seamless between and had to be interoperable from resource provider to resource provider. And we actually, on strategic reasons, took public standards for that. And this is the result. With the exception of Nagos, which is actually something where we couldn't find any um, you know, public standard, the publicly defined standard in terms of proper management, um, everything else is covered by public standards. OVF from DTMF, CDMI, so OCCI, BDII, and usage records are more standards from the domain from the high energy physicists and high throughput academic domain that are probably less known, but in accounting has a lot to do with, uh, with public standards. The NIST is working very closely and very, very um, following up with that also through the SLA standard where metrication and accounting is a, is a big feature. So this infrastructure is running since 2011 and it's running decently, and interestingly enough, it has three different cloud management stacks uh, running underneath all three open source. 
that's OpenStack, Open Nebula, and CloudStack. Um, very early on, some centers tried to use eucalyptus, but they found eucalyptus to be too man resource or human resource intensive and basically not scaling up to their needs. That was actually the University of Oxford, the Oxford E Research Center, where I'm also employed. So this stuff is working. This stuff has about, it's small compared to what hyper converging uh, cloud providers have, but it's reasonable in size for academia. Has about 20,000 nodes that it's managing all across Europe and even um, data centers from Korea, from Australia, from New Zealand, from Japan, the US are interoperable with that and they actually want to become part of that academic federation. So, a couple of conclusions. Standards everywhere. If you look at network switches, RJ45 is a publicly defined standard that everybody is using, even within one authoritative domain. Um, standards enable competition because they provide a level playing field for everybody in the market. Um, they avoid vendor lock-in if interoperability is done right. Um, it improves service continuity, not for you as a provider, but for you as a consumer. If you look at data center operations, uh, you always have redundant uh, provisions of networking, of power, of all these kind of things. These are all based on, standard, on standards. You wouldn't want to say, okay, I have, I have a backup of a system of, of my networking that would use a completely different uh, system. Everything these days is based on ATM and on Ethernet. You wouldn't want to have a backup provider that still uses a token ring, wouldn't you? Um, it actually lowers risk management costs because your, your uh, costs of vendor lock-in uh, rapidly drops when you look at standards-based service provisioning. Look at the ut utility market, particularly in Germany and in the UK. It takes me in the UK about a week to switch my service provider in, uh, in the utility, gas, electricity. So what do I do? Yearly, I do a review of who's providing me my gas, my electricity, based on my service consumption. And recently, actually, one of the providers was a very, very rare, rare thing. They actually um, excelled in service delivery because what they said is they optimized for me my own price plan that they uh, offered within their range said, look, based on your consumption, you should be on that price, price range because it would save you if you would have the same service consumption pattern, it would save you about 100 pounds a year. Fine, okay. I stayed with them. Why not? They, they make me save money by staying on the service. So they excel in service delivery rather than locking me in into my own smart meter at home or something like that. The cost of adaption uh, of adap adapting standards can actually be quite low. If you have standards that are written very well, there's actually an architecture and best practices for writing standards, uh, be it you know, community standards, industry standards, or stuff like that. Um, there is a way of making or writing standards that are very easy to adapt that actually go for you know, separation of concerns. Edgar Dijkstra is, is a very, very leading figure. Even though he's, he made his statement in the 70s, it still holds true. Don't make all-encompassing standards that you have to have one Ansible script that actually writes you your interface code and then do it. That's not maintainable and it's not repeatable and not reliable either. But the biggest impact actually comes from the digital single market. And um, it's a bit difficult to understand, so I'll just spend a couple of minutes there. There are four freedoms of goods that are part of the EC Carter that are unnegotiable. And you see that these days with the struggle, with the power struggle with the UK, who actually wants to say no freedom for workers, but freedom um, of access to the market, which is, uh, from the SE's point of view, very, very, you know, that's real sacrilege. If you apply that to the digital single market, and then you have to think about large, you really have to think large, not in terms of hardware or technology, but in terms of people that are living there and the market size, you have to harmonize threading standards between companies. You have to harmonize certain access standards that can go from chlorinated chicken that has been very, prominently featured in the discussions around uh, CETA and TTIP, the uh, trade agreements with Canada and with the UK, uh, with, sorry, with the US, and the convergence on common standards, be it by trade, be it by in industry, or be it actually by standards in terms of policy or technical that are emerging from the market or have been defined by ISO, Etsy, and the, and the likes. But the real idea is this. If you look at the uh, digital single market, this uh, is something that is not a very 
outspoken, but it's nonetheless one of the big undercurrents and how the commu uh, European Commission is actually working. There are about 22.5 million enterprises in, in, the, uh, in the European Union. That's actually uh, based on Eurostat uh, figures from 2012, so they might be changing, but the general gist is the same. But 99.8% of that are actually SMEs. Think about that. Those SMEs uh, provide um, two-thirds of all the full-time equiv equivalent of employment in the European Union, including um, Norway. Um, the GVA, the um, gross value added, is, is a measurement that I don't quite understand. However, as policy is um, concerned, uh, um, they are more looking at employment because it has uh, massive knock-on effects. The more people you have in employment, the more actually um, the governance and social systems and the European Union and elsewhere in government are actually, um, you know, they improve. So, in terms of uh, resilience and reliability, oops, sorry, this, this is the point. A strong and healthy mid-sized market for, for, um, for companies that play also in the, uh, in, in the cloud arena is actually far more impactful on resilience of governance um, at, a, at large than the few strong players. If something, if, if, say if Google goes down, sorry for just picking on Google this time, um, you know, um, just as a thought experiment, what would happen if Google get, went down like Lehman Brothers in 2008 in the finance industry? We would be at the brink of, net, of breakdown. If a company like, say, Flex, you know, Flex, uh, Flex OS would, come, would go down, it's very bad for the company, but it's, that doesn't have much impact on the resilience and reliability of uh, of your ecosystem, your economy as such. And this is what is driving the European Commission very big and very, is very, very concerned about having people in jobs in a diverse set of companies. And this is what drives the entire H2020 research framework that the European Commission has been put up until the end of 2020. So, in the end, that's the message. Forget everything else, but resistance to standards is future. It will happen. It's just a matter of time, not when or if. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, just, 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 we will take just one question uh, because Oliver already talked to me a couple of times. We are late already for the restaurant. I'm sorry about since that. we are in Germany, <laughs> things are very punctual. So only one question. Uh, I will. Nimat, since you are up. <laughs> But it has to be short. <coughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, first of all, I'm very interested in this area. I've been working with IEEE for a cloud standard. But the challenge is, the only standard that I've seen through the years that was robust and people followed was Belcor, which turned out to be Telcordia. And the reason for that was that service provider got together, they funded, and strictly followed it, and it, it was maintained. But if you look at the standards like the military standard, or ISO, or things like that, it's not as much enforced or followed by, by the company. So when it comes to the cloud, it's, it's fairly wild, wild west, right, right now. And the ones are, pioneering that a lot of them, like let's say Amazon. If you want to come up with these things, you got to bring Amazon and these other people into the uh, picture, plus all the service provider to get the buy-in instead of some committee put some standard together, right? Because at the end of the day, it's impact their profit and loss. So what is the strategy to bring all these people together to get the buy-in to agree on the standard for the cloud? I experienced that um, in small scale in OGF when we had the, um, you know, it was very small scale um, and then that level, but this first an experience. Um, the ISO example with Microsoft is, uh, you know, an external one. Where are we? But it doesn't matter. There. Um, those who have the influence or think they have the influence are the ones who are in control. And it's a, it's, it's a power game, it's a power struggle. You see that at ISO level, you see that at Etsy level, you see that in any kind of standardization or organization. The point is, you have to think inside, not inside out, 
I am the market leader, so I define what the standard is. I am the market leader, and I define the term SRE, so I define what the term is. Now you have to think outside in. Sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> sorry, take away that, that uh, illusion. It's what your customer is, and what the ones who actually take or want to take a service are thinking about you, and what image you're transporting when you play that power struggle game in standardization organizations or in other um, uh, provisioning or procurement um, phases. It's very, very damaging. It's not for a reason that there was this trench war and the Microsoft bashing, because it was because of the Microsoft OXML that really flared the, the, the things up. There was a huge damaging experience, and Microsoft has done a lot to actually mitigate that. With uh, Steve Nadella, I think at the moment their CEO, they have managed to turn the ship around, or at least you see a change in direction. Microsoft has become much more open, certainly on the technical level. Um, but the way of thinking, it's, I'm thinking about business strategy, not the technical quabble about what the standard looks like. In terms of 5G, there's a huge commercial interest, and it's a very, very, I would say, outdated way of thinking. I'm the company that has the patent, therefore I control. Um, it would take too long to talk about all the insights and uh, talk about everything else um, that happens in standardization bodies. Yes, they are subject to reputation. If a standard comes from something that has no reputation or something that nobody knows, then nobody will pay attention to that. So they also are in the game of reputation and relevance. And I think, I personally think that no matter what, how much I believe in a market, um, the boundaries and the rules of the game the grand, in the grand scheme of things have to be given by public authorities for the greater good of things and they have to set firm limits to what companies are allowed to do and what not. I think in the way of standardization um, this has to be found yet. And I think that the need for certain standards to actually and finally go to, uh, to the big providers, to the big four, big six, big seven, um, needs to come through public procurement. And if you look at a company, uh, the country that has 500 million citizens, and uh, it's a very attractive, maybe in the future not so attractive, the trade block, uh, if that trade block is going for common public procurement of cloud resources, then I think it takes about two weeks or three weeks, ideally for the cloud providers to say, yep, we're gonna support that standard. But that's a huge power struggle going on. We can talk about that over, lunch, over dinner, thank you. Thank you, thank you again.